Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be with you today uh, on Discipleship Sunday, as Pastor Jason said just a few minutes ago. And that word discipleship, I would guess that any, just about any church you would walk into today, that would be a word that you would hear. Would you agree? It's a common word that we use in church. But I would also say this, as often as you hear it, most churches, you would probably hear just when they use the word, they might have a slightly different or maybe a vastly different meaning, definition of that word, discipleship. What does it mean? What does it mean to be discipled? What does it mean to make disciples? What is it that is so important about discipleship that we would say, let's dedicate a whole Sunday to just thinking about how we do this and as a church and as individuals and as families? I think many of you sitting out here today would, would affirm that this is important, that this is something God calls us to. At least I hope you would affirm that because that is indeed what Scripture says. Jesus, before he ascended, you know this, he said, go into all the world and make disciples. This is a big deal for us. So my question this morning is, I want to ask you, would you this morning... Would you consider with me for the next few minutes, what does it mean to make disciples? How can you as an individual, how can your family, how can we as a church embrace what Christ has called us to in being his disciples and in making disciples? You know, you could characterize discipleship really by boiling it down into two categories here. A disciple-making church is one that is leading people to Jesus. That the gospel, as Mark just said a minute ago, that through song and through scripture, we are proclaiming the message of redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, through his substitutionary atonement for us on the cross. We have a way, the way, the only way to be made right with God, amen? Part of discipleship starts with leading people to know Jesus and respond to the gospel, but it doesn't stop there. Disciple-making churches also walk with people as they become more like Christ, and we do that in very intentional, specific ways. We teach people the truth of the gospel. The truths of the gospel are things that we should be learning and understanding every day that we walk with Jesus. The gospel is not just our ticket to heaven. The gospel is how we should live our everyday life. We will never mind the depths and the riches of the gospel. We can work every day to apply the truth of it to our lives. So part of discipleship is to teach these truths, to understand these truths. Part of discipleship is that we would be equipped as God's people to serve him with our lives. As we understand who he is and what he has done for us, it is not meant for us just to sit and to soak and then to sour, but we are to be mobilized. We are to take what we know and the gifts that God has given us, and we are to be on mission to live lives for his glory. That's part of being a disciple. And then the most important thing that we could say today is that it doesn't even just stop there. Our calling as believers, if you were sitting here today as a follower of Jesus, the calling on your life is that you would make disciples. That you would tell someone else about Jesus and that you would walk with them as they become more Christ-like. And then that process just continues on and on and on as the gospel of Jesus goes forth and his kingdom is advanced. That's a disciple-making church, amen? So that leads us to saying, hey, the reality is healthy churches make disciples. So I want to ask you this morning, is First Baptist Church, Bernie, are we a healthy church? Are we a church that is on mission for God? Are we a church that is making disciples? I want us to explore that today and to start exploring that today. We need to think about, well, then what are the keys of discipleship? I mean, if this is what God's called us to do and if healthy churches do this, how do we do it? What are the things that are necessary for us to do it? You know, when it comes to discipleship, there is so much material out there in the world about discipleship. There is a, you could, you could find books on these four principles. 
to having a discipleship culture, seven healthy habits of disciple making. You could read blogs and articles and, and you could watch videos and, and you, could, you, could, you could spend so much time exploring different models and strategies and tools that help toward this purpose of discipleship. But can I tell you something? Tools are incredibly useful. Books are so helpful to help us understand and get our minds around what God has called us to do, but they are really just that. They are tools and they are helpful things for us to use, but in and of themselves, they don't make disciples. What about environments? Maybe that's the key. Maybe it's our environments like our growth groups or our Wednesday night classes or our, our weekday Bible studies that our men's ministry and women's ministry does or, or youth on Wednesday night or, or children's ministry on, on Sundays and Wednesdays. Maybe it's, maybe it's that. Maybe it's our environments. That's the key to discipleship. Can I tell you? It doesn't matter if you are in the best growth group that FBC has to offer. Just attending that growth group alone is not the key to discipleship. Well, then, obviously, it's the word of God, correct? What does God's word have to say? That should be our foundation. That's where we should go to understand what the key to discipleship. And there are so many passages that we could look at to understand this. I mean, think with me for a minute. We, we, we've got the Great Commission. We've already referenced it this morning where Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey the truths of God's word, right? That, that's discipleship. We can understand what it means from there, but there's other passages. We could go to Jesus' teaching in John chapter 8 where he talks about our relationship to him, that he is the vine, and we are the branches, and we are to abide in Christ, we could, we could really begin to dig deep and understand what it means to walk with Jesus by understanding what he's saying in John chapter 8. We could go to the epistles, and we could look at Paul's model and how he lived his life, and especially his relationship with Timothy, where he says, Timothy, what you have seen in me, I want you to entrust it to faithful men who are also able to then pass it on. This Paul-Timothy relationship where we are pouring in to another what God has poured into us, and we just continue doing that. There's so many different places we could go in God's word to understand these keys to discipleship. But can I tell you this? Just knowing where those passages are, just hearing sermons or instruction on the principles that are contained in God's word in and of themselves, they are not enough just to hear them. They're not going to change the trajectory of your life, of your family, or our church when it comes to discipleship. Just knowing that those scriptures are there. It's going to require something more for us to be a healthy, disciple-making church. We could go down even deeper as we think through this, and we could say, well, let's look at Jesus. Let's look at the Gospels and see how he lived his life and understand and glean clues about how we can be about discipleship from the life of Jesus, from his ministry. Maybe that will give us some idea of where to start. I mean, so we might naturally go to thinking through some of his, the greatest moments throughout the Gospels in Jesus' life, like the feeding of the 5,000, the Sermon on the Mount, some of these big crowd moments with Jesus. But I think it's very interesting to note that how relatively small the percentage is of time that Jesus actually spent with the crowds during his ministry in comparison to the amount of time he spent with small groups of people and individuals. Consider this with me for a minute because I think this is gonna be helpful for us today as we consider what God is calling us to do in this area. By the end of Jesus' ministry, his congregation was about 120 people. He had gone from crowds of thousands to just a little over 100. And the majority of his time in the last 18 months of his three-year ministry was spent with his 12 disciples. And even from there, that amount of time with the 12 was actually, a lot of that time was spent with three. Some very intentional time was spent with three of the 12, Peter, James, and John. 
And even when we see Jesus with the crowds throughout his ministry, oftentimes did he not find that one individual in the crowd that needed a special touch or a special word or an encounter with him. From Jesus' ministry, I think we begin to see what he's calling us to, how it is that we can live out our faith, to be a follower of Jesus, and then to make disciples as well. And so this morning, I want us to, I want us to focus in on one account in Scripture where Jesus does that very thing, where he focuses in on an individual. This is one of my favorite narratives in the New Testament, and it's the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to open it up to John chapter 4 with me for just a minute. For some in the room today, this is a very familiar story. You could get up today and you could, you could give this narrative and you could share it. But for those here today who maybe you're not familiar with this passage, let me just give you the cliff notes of the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples are traveling from southern Israel in the region of Judea and they're headed north to Galilee. And along the way, as they travel, this is a common journey that the Jewish people would take, and they always would take the long way around to get there to avoid one specific area, Samaria. Why would they avoid Samaria? Because Samaritans were there. And the Jews didn't like Samaritans, and the Samaritans weren't very fond of the Jews. It was a mutual hate-hate relationship. All right, and so Jesus, though, he would have none of that. And on his journey, he decided to go straight through Samaria. And as the story begins to unfold, we quickly learn why he had to do that. There was a divine appointment for him waiting by a well. There was a conversation. There was an encounter. There was a relationship that he wanted to build with a specific person that was waiting for him in Samaria. And then as we're introduced to this woman at the well, we, un- we learn about her story. And it's a sad one that ultimately leads to and leave, leads, leaves her cynical and lonely. I mean, she even would go out to draw water from the well when she knew no one else would be there because she wanted to avoid the shame and the reproach of the town who all looked at her with disdain, but not Jesus. And so as he is there with her, he strikes up a conversation with her. And it is, it is one of the most profound conversations in all of Scripture. Did you know that this conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well is the longest recorded conversation in the Gospels that Jesus has with one individual? It's the longest one. The woman at the well is the first person that Jesus reveals his true identity as the Messiah. The results of this conversation are profound. This passage has been used countless times to preach, and rightly so, to teach the glorious truths of the gospel. Jesus offers her living water. He tells her that her greatest longings and desires can only be quenched by drinking deeply of him. And the truth that he proclaims to her that day leads to transformation in her life, and not just her life, in the whole community. The story ends with a celebration because Jesus is there and he begins to teach and talk to this town. And many people, John tells us, place their faith in Jesus as Messiah as a result of this interaction that Jesus has with the woman at the well. It's an incredible story. But for our purpose this morning, I want us to examine this story for a few minutes and I want us to see the overriding theme and priority of Jesus' ministry that is takes center stage in this story. It's not the only place, but this is such a beautiful place to see it, is Jesus' is the value he places on life-on-life relationships. 
So what does that look like? And here in this passage, there's three principles that I think will really be helpful for us as we move forward today in his interaction with this woman at the well. When we see these this morning, I think it gives us some clues about what discipleship could look like at First Baptist Bernie. What are some of those ingredients and keys that are necessary for us to be a healthy disciple-making church? And here are those three things I want you to see as we just kind of comb through the passage for a few minutes. First of all, it was intentional. This conversation, this interaction, this relationship took intentionality. And it wasn't just intentional that we're going to spend time together, but it was intentional to do something. It was intentional to create an appetite in this lady from Samaria at the well to want and long for and practice the right things. And ultimately, this intentional relationship that created this appetite was rooted in the truth and it led to transformation. Church family, as we look at this passage, we're going to explore these three things for just a minute. And I want you to be asking yourselves as we go along, I need to be asking myself as we go along today, are these Things Are these principles, are these elements present in my life and in my family? And are they present in our church? Because I think these are key for us to living out the mission that God has called us to as his followers. So let's look at them one by one. So let's, talk, let's stop, start with intentionality. Jesus didn't just happen to run into this woman at the well. He planned it. He even put himself in uncomfortable and inconvenient situations in order to enter her world and to do life with her. Look at some of the verses that we would see that would help us understand this. John 4, 4 says, and he had to pass through Samaria. I have that word had circled in my Bible because I love it. Jesus, it wasn't just that, eh, okay, I'll do it, or I just kind of stumbled upon it. No, He set out to do this. He had to go through Samaria because there was a lady there that needed to know who he was. He had to do it. He was intentional. And then he strikes up a conversation with her. And this is where it gets uncomfortable. Culturally, this is is taboo for him. He says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water in verse 7. And Jesus said to her, we could stop right there and say, whoa. Because as the woman is going to say in verse 9, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You're a man. I'm a woman. This is wrong on so many levels, Jesus. This doesn't happen. Why would you be doing this? Jesus was doing this because it needed to be done. Because this woman had a need in her life that only the truth of who he was could satisfy. And so he showed intentionality to place himself in places that maybe were inconvenient for him. That maybe would cause people to look at him and say, well, why are you using your time like that? Jesus, there's better places for you to go than Samaria. Jesus, you're really going to hurt your ministry if you hang out in places like this. The Jews aren't going to want to associate with you if you're hanging out in Samaria. There's so many reasons that Jesus could have avoided Samaria, but he went there because he cared because he wanted to show value to this woman. He wanted her to understand who he was. And so church, I want you, as we consider the intentionality of Jesus to do what he did by going to Samaria, I want you to ask yourself some questions. And here's a couple that I thought of today as I was thinking through this myself that I wanna ask you today. How intentional are you with the people who are already in your life? Think for a minute with me. What are the circles you are already running in? How intentional are you with the relationships that God has blessed you with? Moms and dads with your kids. Do you let the schedule just kind of drive you? Or do you take control of the schedule to make sure you carve out intentional times with your children? Think about the friendships that you have. What characterizes them? Are they just, well, whenever we kind of can run into each other, we will. We don't really make a plan. We really don't, we really don't think about really pursuing intentional relationships that, that give life and, and help us grow in our everyday life. How intentional are you with the people who are already in your, in your life? 
Husbands, how intentional are you with your wives? Wives with your husbands. Intentionality is key to discipleship as we are seeing here. If Jesus had not been intentional, this woman would have never known the truth of who Jesus was. She would have continued to be alone and rejected. But Jesus says, I will, I will inconvenience myself. I will rearrange my schedule in order to spend time with her. Do we do that? It's a good question. Are we willing to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations and inconvenient places to introduce someone to Jesus or to walk alongside them as they grow in their faith? I think this this right here, this question right here is why so many churches would be on the side of unhealthy when it comes to a scale of healthy or unhealthy churches when it comes to disciple making. It's because the answer to this question is no. We're not really willing to have our schedules, our routines interrupted to be used by God to pour into someone else. And church, I want to tell you this morning, discipleship is going to require that. If we are going to see God use us to pour into other people, to help them in their walk with Jesus, or to introduce someone to Jesus, it will require of us, not maybe, it will require us shifting in priorities of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's exactly what Jesus did, and he was intentional about it. But let's move on, and let's think for a minute about that next phrase that we said. This, it, we need things that create an appetite for us. It created an appetite for the right things. Look at what Jesus said as he begins talking to this woman at the well. Jesus asked her for a drink in verse 7, and then in verse 10, after she says, why are you doing this? He says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, Jesus is calling out something here. He is unwilling to let her settle for a cheap imitation when he's offering her the real thing. She's been trying to fill her life with things that would not satisfy. And Jesus says, listen, I want there to be an appetite, a hunger in you, a thirst in you that recognizes those things won't fulfill you, but I can. And so he begins to ask questions and direct the conversation to create this appetite in her so that she would desire living water. He does that in verse 13 and 14 where he says, everyone who drinks of this water at this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Do you see Jesus is just drawing her in, making her lean in and say, oh, I've longed for that. That is exactly what I need. And then look what it leads her to say in verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Church, you know why so many times I struggle to apply the truths of the gospel in my everyday life, how I'm so easy to forget and be distracted by cheap imitations and substitute for the real thing is because I don't always have people in my life. There have been seasons where I've not had people in my life who are helping to create that appetite in me to long for the real thing. I'm the only person I'm listening to, or my community is not pointing me to Jesus and creating those appetites in me to recognize where I'm settling for things that I shouldn't and to help me desire the things that I should that are from God. We all need that. The circumstances in our lives, all the busyness and the things we do throughout our life, it's easy for us to get distracted and to have our appetite, try to fulfill our appetites with things that won't satisfy Part of discipleship, part of what Jesus was doing with this woman, and part of what we need to be doing as we do life together in intentional relationships is to be helping to create appetites in each other for the gospel to be applied to the depths of our hearts to transform us more and more. So when we think about 
how Jesus used this intentional conversation to get to the heart of what was going on in this woman's life, I wanna ask you a couple of more questions. Some more things for you to evaluate today. How many of your relationships ever get beyond surface level conversations? Just take inventory for a moment in your life. Are there people that really know you? Are there people that you talk about real life things with, struggles, fears, worries, that people that can get into the messiness of life with you? Do you have those people? Or do you just talk about the weather and you know the latest thing your favorite football team has done? I mean, what are those conversations like? Think about them for a moment. And then a follow-up question, do you prioritize being in relationships where you are encouraged to look at your motivations and desires and pursuits in light of the gospel? Church, this is key. This is key for us as we do life together as the body of Christ and as we find those intentional relationships that God wants to place in our life, we need to use those in the right way And it is to have these kinds of gospel conversations that really get to the heart of why we do what we do and how we do it. And and it allows God's voice to be much more clear in our everyday lives when we have other people who are pouring into us. And then we get to do that for other people. See, Jesus just cut through the noise in this woman's life and he got to the heart of what was going on to make her consider where she was, why she was there, and what was she gonna do about it. And then let's look at this third thing that needs to be part, this third ingredient or principle that needs to be part of our lives if we're truly gonna understand what it means to to be discipled and, and, and this idea of discipleship, and that is truth that leads to transformation. But it's not just speaking the truth to just any random person. I love that in this story, Jesus used the power of a relationship that he had formed to speak the truth and to open the door for transformation. There's other places Jesus has done this throughout the Gospels. You might think of the story of Zacchaeus where he goes to his home. And there he confronts him with with the truth of the gospel and Zacchaeus' life is transformed. This This is the same kind of pattern we see here with the woman at the well. He sought her out intentionally, shared with her the truth of who she was, showed her the difference of following him and what she was settling for. And then he was able to lead her forward. But he is bold in that. Church, to boldly speak into someone's life which sometimes I think we are, we are willing to do, right? We look around at people sometimes and we say, well, I, I, I told them the truth, right? I saw the sin in their life and I called it out. Well, how did you call it out, right? Did you just walk up and say it or, or have you, had you been working to cultivate a relationship so they knew that you actually cared about them or did it come across harsh and judgmental? I mean, think about what Jesus said here to the woman in verses 16 through 18. She says, I want this water. Give me this drink, sir. And he says, okay, sure. Go call your husband and come here. We may think, well, that's not, you know, that's not too weird of a, of a request. He wants, he wants her husband to hear it too. They can hear this together. But Jesus, knowing what he knows, allows us to see this is, this is a bold statement by Jesus. He says, you're right. You have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're with now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, that is really kind of tame. Um, you know, if, if we were to say that today, right? I mean, that's like, whoa, that is like stepping on toes direct as Jesus calls out the sin in her life, as he, call, he puts his finger on the issue. 
And that's a good thing because putting his finger on the issue and exposing this lie that she has believed about herself, this lie that she has believed about what will satisfy her and will give her identity and worth, he needed to put his finger on that and he needed to expose it to the truth because that was the only way her life was gonna be transformed. But you've gotta understand how he did it. He did it in the context of relationship. He spoke to her. He showed her dignity and respect and value. He spent time with her. He went out of his way to spend time with her. He crossed over things that most people would not have in order to do that. Church family, if we're going to see real transformation in our lives and in the lives of others, we have got to be people who are willing to start doing real life with people because that is the fertile ground that God most often uses to do deep works of transformation because we need that. We need people who are willing to share with us the truth that we need to hear that maybe we're blind to, but to do it in the right way. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. Who have you permitted to speak truth into your life, to help you deal with your sin so that you could experience greater intimacy with Christ? Do you have those people? If not, you need them. You need people who you say, hey, you've got permission anytime, any place. If you see something going on in me that looks like it's leading me away from fellowship with God, I need you to call it out in me. We all need that. And we need to be that for others. But also here, Jesus was so, he so easily took where she was and applied the truth of the gospel to the situation so that transformation could happen. And so this leads me to ask a second question here. Are you equipped to apply the truth of the gospel to the everyday stuff of life? You see, for many of us, we think because we're here week in and week out, and maybe because we attend a growth group and and, and we're involved in church activity, we think, okay, we know everything we need to know to walk with Jesus. And I would agree that many of you in this room today know a lot of stuff. But my question for all of us, my question for myself is, am I continuing to know the gospel better and better? Because it is the truth of the gospel that must be applied to my everyday life in order for it to be transformed to look more and more like Jesus. So are you equipped? Are you in God's word? Are you you getting those tools that are available to you? Are you using them so that you can really allow God to do that work in you and then help others in that pursuit in their life? Truth leads to transformation, but fertile ground is when it happens in the context of relationships. So, So what's the bottom line for us this morning? It's that each of us needs intentional relationships that create an appetite for practicing the gospel in our everyday lives. Church, this is how we become a disciple-making church. This is how we lean into this idea of discipleship and allow it to just change everything about us. It's when we embrace that we need this, these relationships, these relationships that are intentional to create in us a desire for the things of God so that we will then begin in our everyday life to live it out. It happens through relationships. We don't do it alone. We do it as we live life with others. And church, can I just tell you this morning that I long for First Baptist Bernie to be permeated with this kind of culture of life-on-life discipleship. Individuals, families, growth groups, Bible studies, ministries, serving teams that are all embracing the reality that we need to pursue intentional relationships so that God can use them to transform us more and more into the image of his son. 
And as we return to our routines after the summer, this is such a good time for us to stop and consider these things. To think through the ways that we have here at our church, the tools and the environments that allow us to be equipped with easy on-ramps so that we can do life-on-life discipleship, these intentional relationships. All the necessary ingredients are here. So the question is, are we using them? Are we being intentional to use them? Now, but I do, before I share a few of those with you, I need you quickly to hear me say a few things. First of all, I just want to say it. There's a lot going on at First Baptist Bernie. I mean, there's things going on here every day of the week. God's doing incredible things through different ministries and groups here on our campus. We're part of a great church that's doing a lot of stuff. But in no way do we expect you to be doing everything that's going on here. So I want to give you permission this morning. You don't have to do everything. But what I want to say to you this morning is pick the things that make the most sense where you are in this season of your life to push you forward in your walk with Jesus and to help then invest in other people for the same thing. Pick those things that make the most sense that are going to make the biggest impact in your life. I want to say this to you as well. If you're here and you're part of this church family, you need to be in a growth group. Hands down, we all need to be in a group of people because it's in those environments where we're doing life with people that we're most likely gonna find those one or two or three people that we need to really be intentional about doing life together. It's gonna be really hard in a room full of people like this to find those two or three people that you can get real with and start to really walk with. But you get in a growth group, it gets a little smaller. And then from there, you get to know people and you start sharing life and, and, and fellowshipping with them. And then God starts to draw your heart to certain people. They're like, hey, we connect. We're, we're kind of in the same season of life. Or maybe you've been through something already that I'm going through. And man, God just kind of links our hearts up together and we need to do life together. Church, you're not gonna find that unless you are intentional to say, okay, I've not been in a group. I've not found a group of people to do life with here But my step as I enter this fall season is to find a group. You need to be in a group. Here's the last thing I want to say before I share some tools with you. Maybe you are involved in a lot of things. A different Bible study for every day of the week. I'm going to say something now that a discipleship pastor might ought not to say. I give you permission to bail on a couple of those Bible studies every week if you will use the margin you create to pursue intentional life-on-life relationships for the purpose of discipleship. Maybe you're just getting, maybe you're doing too many things and maybe you need to scale back and that's why you don't have the margin to really walk alongside and do life with somebody. Guess what? It's okay to simplify your schedule a little bit in order to prioritize and use your time for better things. And can I tell you, if you don't have intentional relationships, then that is something you need to create margin for because that's where transformation is gonna continue to happen in our lives. So with that said, quickly, I wanna tell you what's out in the plaza as you leave here today. There's some tables. You might have seen them as you came in this morning. These tables are set up with some of those tools and easy on-ramps for you to take a next step when it comes to discipleship. Over to my left, and as you walk out, it'll be to the, to the left out there, is our next-gen area, our youth and children's ministry. We've been working for a couple of years to create something we're calling a next-gen roadmap. This is something so exciting because the deepest desire of our Next Gen ministry is to partner with you as parents. Moms and dads, this is just a simple guide that tells you how we want to partner with you at every stage of your child's development as they are growing to know and love Jesus. This shares with you certain tips for things you could practice in your home. This will share with you things that we will focus on here when they are with us in our ministry environments. This shares ways that we're going to celebrate certain milestones in their walk with the Lord. 
And then it's going to give you some ideas of different activities and ways that we want to reinforce what you were doing in the home as you disciple your kids. We're going to continue to use this. We're going to continue to supplement this with other resources and suggestions and tools that you could use to be more intentional in your home to disciple your greatest opportunity to raise up the next generation to know and love Jesus, and that is your children. So go to the Next Gen table and pick one of these up. Also, you'll see out there that we've got a table set up with all the things that go on each and every week, our Wednesday night classes and our growth groups. We've talked a lot about these. I don't need to spend a lot of time on these. These are tools to help equip you to know how to apply the gospel into your everyday life. That's what Wednesday nights are for, adults. Our growth groups are just that fertile ground where you need to commit to do life with other people so that God can lead you to those relationships that allow him to continue to transform you more and more into the image of his son. Also out there for our adults, there's something I'm so excited that our men's and women's ministry is helping us to to launch. We are building up and we are getting organized and ready for something we're gonna call real life mentoring. And this is simply... a a system, a little bit of organization to help you connect with people that you can be very intentional to do life with. We all need people who have been where we are that are further along in their walk with the Lord who are pouring into us. And then in turn, we need to be doing that for someone else. But sometimes that's tricky. It may be a little scary to reach out and say, I need someone in my life then we have to admit that we don't have all the answers. But yet deep down, we know we need someone wiser and more mature than us to be pouring into us. And then maybe you're sitting here saying, oh, that's scary for me to think about investing in somebody. I don't know anything. How could I do that? Right, and so there's all these roadblocks that might keep you from these intentional relationships. But these intentional relationships, as we've seen today, are crucial to us being more and more like Jesus and living for him. And so we want to give you, we want to remove some of those obstacles. And so on September 8th, on a Sunday morning after the second service, we're going to provide a free lunch. If you are interested in knowing more about how you could have someone in your life that's mentoring you, or how you could mentor someone else, I want you to come to this lunch. And there's a sign-up sheet out in the plaza for you to take a next step. Say, hey, I just want to know more about it. Maybe that's the step. And then for, that's for all of our adults, senior adults in the room. I've got something exciting and special just to tell you guys about that, would, that will help you along this journey of being intentional to disciple others. It's a class we're offering this Wednesday, on Wednesday nights beginning this Wednesday. It's called Grandparenting Matters. This is a way for you to share the incredible wisdom, experience, and influence that you have in discipling your grandkids. There'll be teaching, there'll be discussion, there'll be times for you to interact with others, to think through ways that you can be intentional to pour into your family from your unique position as a grandparent. And oh, by the way, also to see yourselves as prayer warriors and encouragers and grandparents at large for this church body to pour into us and our kids to help share the wisdom you have to be intentional about continuing to disciple. Guys, you guys have an incredible voice and wisdom that we need that would help us continue to grow in our knowledge of Jesus and of living out what he's called us to do. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something right now. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Just bow your head right there where you sit as our worship team comes. We're going to close with a song, and this is your chance to do business with God. Whatever he's laying on your heart this morning, however he's working in your life, this is your chance to respond to his spirit as he moves. Maybe you're sitting here this morning 
And God is impressing upon your heart that, yeah, I do need to do life with other believers, but first and foremost, I need to be doing life with Jesus. Like I've never received that living water that he offered to the woman at the well. I've never placed my faith in Jesus. Church, could I tell you today, if you're sitting here in this room and you don't know Jesus, today is a great day for you to cry out to him for salvation. We'll have ministers down front who would love to talk with you more about that if you know that is what God's impressing on your heart. But maybe you're here today and you're, you've placed your faith in Jesus. Can I just encourage you today? What is the next step that you need to take? Can I just plead with you this morning? Take one step toward more intentional life-on-life, discipleship-focused relationships. Maybe it's getting in a growth group. Maybe it's signing up for the mentoring luncheon. Maybe it's picking up a next-gen roadmap. Whatever it might be, will you this morning take one step toward relationships that will push you toward greater transformation in your life as you walk with Jesus? So God, use these next moments to draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me?